panel on the commercial lunar payload services. Our panel moderator is Ben Bussey. Ben, come on up. You want to introduce our panelists? You both have slides loaded? Yeah. Okay, so. Ooh. I'm not touching anything. Every time someone comes up here, they just say the word sticky. Um, <laughs> so there are um, two commercial panels this afternoon. The first one is um, commercial lunar payload services. And we will specifically um, be talking about, we have the uh, representatives from Intuitive Machines and Astrobotic who are the, doing the first two clips deliveries for NASA. And we have presentations and then questions. And then immediately following that, is a more general um, um, panel that Kurt's leading um, related to sort of cis lunar economy, and that will have more of the um, more companies represented up here. So um, let's go alphabetically. Um, and so if we could if we could pull up the astrobotic presentation, and Dan Herrickson be given the talk, the sticky one. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Dan Hendrickson, and I'm from Astrobotic. We're a lunar logistics company based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we were founded to address this problem, which I think everyone here in the room is quite well aware of, that historically speaking, lunar missions are too expensive and too complicated. Um, there's a major large barrier for these missions to happen on a regular basis, at least in the past. Um, so we take a shipping model approach to delivering payloads for companies and governments, universities and nonprofits around the world. Um, we do that with a modular spacecraft that can accommodate a variety of payloads on a single mission. And by offering our capacity on a per kilogram pricing point, um, we feel like that really brings down the barrier and enables everyone to have access uh, to the lunar surface as it should be. So we have a number of product lines that enable that access in the first place. Uh, on the left side, you can see our lander product lines. The top one on the left is Peregrine. Uh, that's our lunar lander that can deliver 200 kilograms to the surface. Uh, that will be the product line that will be flying first. Um, it'll be carrying the first collection of uh, NASA Eclipse Task Order 2 payloads, as well as a number of signed customers outside of NASA, which I'll highlight uh, in further detail later. Uh, we also have our Griffin Lunar Lander. This is a vehicle that can carry about double the capacity of Peregrine at 400 kilos. Um, regardless of which lunar lander you fly on, you have the same price point. Um, so we offer that 1.2 million per kilogram to the lunar surface. That includes power and communication for all of our payloads to operate once on the surface. So it's not just the ride, but it's also the commodities to be able to operate and then successfully carry out uh, your operation that, that you're planning. And then on the right side, we have our rover product lines. Um, so uh, on the top right there, you see the Cube Rover. Um, it's exactly as the name sounds. It's meant to standardize smaller mobility on the surface. Uh, we offer that as a capability also on a per kilogram price point. Actually, today is the first time I think that we've publicly announced our pricing for that. So that's 4.5 million per kilogram. It also provides an allotment of power and communications, just like on a lander. It incorporates also the delivery to the surface. So if you buy a kilo on a cube rover, you get all the way down to the surface with that per kilogram price point that you see on the right. And then at the larger scale, we also have our Polaris rover. Uh, this is a vehicle that uh, would fly on our Griffin lander uh, that you see on the left. Cube rovers can go on Peregrine or Griffin. Uh, and again, it's an end-to-end -end delivery vehicle that can offer mobility once on the surface. Um, if you have questions or specific interest on the planetary mobility side and the rovers, um, please see Mike Provenzano. Um, he'll be at the table later today. He can answer more questions. Um, so we're really excited to kind of roll that out uh, more publicly here in the pricing and the services uh, here at League. In addition to our lander delivery services and our rover delivery services, we also have uh, basically an R&D group uh, that we call Future Missions and Technology. Uh, it's this group that is developing our terrain relative navigation system and sensor. 
Uh, they are focusing on the next generation capabilities that, that our lander services and our rover services will need in the future. And so, for example, that TRN service is, our sensor, excuse me, is being developed within that group uh, under a NASA Tipping Point Award. Um, and that TRN system will actually fly on our first Peregrine mission uh, as a payload. And so we'll be able to demonstrate and show uh, that 100 meter precision. And they also are developing a number of other technologies. Uh, please feel free to, to see us during that 5 p.m. session to talk further about that tech. So to speak a little more just directly to our Peregrine Lunar Lander, which as mentioned, will be flying first. Um, this is a product line. Uh, it's a vehicle that will fly over and over again from a design perspective. Uh, historically speaking, of course, planetary missions have not really reused their spacecraft bus over and over. Um, that's how we're, we're starting to change that paradigm and enable our 1.2 million per kilogram price point uh, well into the future. Um, so Peregrine is really meant to be one lander for any mission. Uh, we can carry a whole variety of different kinds of payloads on a single mission, and we put a, a great emphasis on reliability and low complexity. So we're working with a number of uh, different providers that are very well known, uh, incorporated into our program. Uh, we've been working with them for a number of years now, and we're really excited to be, to be flying Peregrine uh, relatively shortly. So you may have seen in the news uh, back in May, uh, we were very excited and humbled uh, to be selected by the NASA CLIPS program. Uh, this is a, an awesome responsibility that we don't take lightly uh, to be carrying the first American payloads to the lunar surface since Apollo. Uh, we've been selected to carry up to 14 NASA payloads, which we'll be finalizing with the CLIPS program uh, relatively soon. Uh, mission one is set to fly in, in summer of 2021. So we're making progress right now toward the CDR, which is scheduled in January. So we're really excited to be taking the next step uh, on the important next milestone for our, our vehicle program. We're also really excited to have 16 signed payloads for our first mission. So as mentioned, uh, NASA is one of just of these 16 customers. Um, so while they have a, a number of payloads that they'll have on board as part of that second task order, uh, we have uh, 15 other non-NASA payloads, uh, which I'll highlight a little bit more in, in a slide or two. We've successfully completed three NASA CLIPS milestones uh, to date. So uh, we've been executing to plan. Uh, it's very exciting to, to be hitting all of our milestones on schedule. Um, and I think I, I have to really emphasize here how great it's been to work with the NASA CLIPS office out of JSC, uh, all the folks out of headquarters. It's really been a great new paradigm. And I think this is uh, just the, the first of many exciting developments. NASA truly gets it, I think, when it comes to working with companies like ours. So we're just really have nothing but great things to say working with, with the CLIPS program in particular. Um, this is gonna be an exciting new era and we're really thrilled to be taking these steps with the CLIPS program on the first mission. Should also note we have a number of our long lead items already initiated for procurement. Um, so we'll be having hardware very soon in our facilities. So we're incredibly excited. It's about time. Uh, for moon missions like us to be bringing that hardware uh, and actually have that uh, in-house. We've also been hiring. Uh, we're now at 57 uh, full-time employees at the company. Uh, we've got a number of really great talent coming from across the aerospace sector that we've brought on board. Um, our safety and mission assurance lead is actually here uh, at Astrobotic and, and here at League, so you can actually meet him and get a sense of how we're doing that program uh, for all of our payload customers and for our lunar lander program. We also have a new uh, senior space architect who has 40 plus years of experience uh, in planetary missions. Uh, Warren James in the back there, so you might have had a chance to meet him. So please come over to our table at 5 p.m. And, and meet all the great folks that we have from Astrobotic. Uh, we also have our payload managers. Uh, and we have dedicated folks working full time to make sure that your payload is going to be successful. Um, so those folks are on the lander team, but they're interfacing with you on a regular basis if you're a payload builder and making sure you're meeting milestones and you have a full awareness of all the milestones that are coming up. We're also proud to, uh, to note that a few months ago, we officially signed for the Vulcan Centaur. So we're on contract. Uh, again, we'll be flying in the summer of 2021. Uh, very excited to be on the, the Vulcan Centaur. Obviously, ULA has a great track record of reliability. So we're, we're thrilled to officially be on the clock uh, for launch. We also recently procured a new headquarters. Uh, this is a, a facility that has 40,000 plus square uh, facility space, has an 8,000 square foot clean room already in the building. Uh, we do need to make some modifications and renovations to the building, which we're starting now. 
Uh, but it's incredibly exciting to be expanding and to have enough room for three landers to be built simultaneously at once uh, with this new headquarters. Um, and it's also very exciting, just as a side note, to have a large facility like this in Pittsburgh doing space activities. Uh, it's just incredibly exciting for our region of the country. So as mentioned, we have 16 signed customers for our first mission. NASA is one of those customers. Uh, we have a whole variety of different companies, governments, universities, nonprofits that are signed on for the first mission. Um, we're very proud of this as a differentiation, as a provider, uh, because I think the market has really spoken in droves to having actual signed contracts for the, the first mission. I think that's a, an important statement for all of us in the lunar community to see how real this market is. We have actual paying customers to go to the moon. Obviously, we haven't flown yet, but we already have 16 contracts, which is, I think, a, a significant statement for all the hard work that this community in this room has been doing for, frankly, decades. Just to show in a couple examples of our most uh, recent signed contracts that we have, uh, on the left, we have Diamond. This is a, a Japanese company that's build, building a single axle, uh, two-wheeled rover. Uh, they see a long-term business plan on the moon, and so they see this as the opportunity to send the first rover and actually test out their concept and their tech. And then on the right, you see a very kind of futuristic and interesting payload here. Uh, this is from Spacebit out of the UK. So this is a new kind of mobility on the surface, obviously, uh, with legs. So it's uh, pretty exciting to see different approaches to mobility. This is a chance to really try new things. Uh, and the businesses that we have contracted with and organizations we've contracted with see our mission as the chance to do exactly that. So this is really a, a platform for new creativity and new organizations to come into the fold to finally have access to the lunar surface. And those payloads will be flying here in this configuration for Peregrine. Uh, we're going to be a co-manifested payload on the launch vehicle. Uh, so we'll be flying with a, another payload uh, on on that configuration. We carry 90 kilos on this first mission. Uh, in the future, we'll have 200 kilograms of capacity on Peregrine, but this first mission, uh, a little bit lower than that because it is going to be the, the first one. We'll be operating for eight Earth days uh, on the surface. We provide uh, 20 kilobits per second per kilogram of every, every payload that's purchased by the customer. Uh, we have tw uh, half watt of, of power per kilogram uh, as pro provided as part of the, the overall service. And then payloads, they integrate above and below the deck. So there's some payloads that want to have access to the sky or uh, to other view factors. Um, and they're mounted on the top. And then we also have uh, the opportunity for obviously rovers to attach to the bottom and then separate and go off onto the surface from there. So as mentioned, Peregrine is a product line. So we're going to be flying over and over again. Um, this vehicle is planned for many missions into the future. Uh, we'll be growing the capacity on future missions up to 200 kilos. Uh, there's a number of different arrangements that are possible. Um, you could have is it a co-manifested payload, or you can ha even have two peregrines flying together uh, as a primary payload. So it allows for distributed architectures and the ability to go to multiple places on a single mission. And then just to, to note, lastly with Peregrine, there's a variety of different configurations that outside of the payload bus you can have to be able to go to different destinations and have different kinds of payload types on a single mission. So it's possible to go to a pole, uh, it's possible to go to really any latitude, um, maybe possible to go to the far side if you had a communication asset uh, to relay uh, to Peregrine. So there's a whole variety of different kinds of, of mission profiles that are enabled by this core spacecraft, which is meant to be as flexible as possible to enable a variety of different visions uh, to utilize it. So a couple of parting thoughts, um, just to note, uh, we have a number of resources uh, for the payload community. Uh, we have our payload user's guide, which is freely available on our website right now. Uh, we also have an uh, interface de definition document that we can provide under a confidential basis. Uh, that provides an even deeper layer of technical integration information. Um, we also have our CAD file, so it's possible to actually get an understanding of how your payload would directly integrate with Peregrine. And then most importantly, we have a personalized service that is meant to work directly with each of you on a regular basis. Again, our, our payload managers are here in the audience. Um, they'll be at the table uh, later today, and your success is their success ultimately. Uh, we try to be a very market-focused organization, hence why we've had, I think, the, the number of contracts that we've been able to sign for Mission 1. Um, so we're really excited to make your, your vision a reality on the lunar surface. 
Um, so just one additional parting thought. Um, we are still hiring, uh, so please check out our website for all the different uh, kinds of positions that we're looking for right now. Um, we have our Peregrine core team in place, but we are uh, looking to expand even further for all the exciting opportunities that are coming up on the lunar horizon. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll do, we'll do questions for both at the end. If we put out the next presentation, um, Tim Crane from Intuitive Machines. What an act to follow. I had to resist the urge to get my phone out and take pictures of the charts for our market research. So, great job, Dan. Okay. So uh, let me see if I can uh, negotiate this. I, I am Tim Crane, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about intuitive machines. Uh, before I do, though, um, this is the first uh, lunar science uh, meeting I've attended. Uh, I'm an engineer through and through. But uh, the enthusiasm is uh, it's infectious. So we were already super excited to be um, selected for CLIPS as a program and, and to be one of the, the task order two uh, winners along with um, Astrobotics and, and Orbit Beyond before. And, uh, you know, I, I feel a little bit more of a spring in my step, but also a little bit of, we're all counting on you, kid. So uh, best of luck to Astrobotic, and, and we hope to land two landers to, to enable some of the things that we've talked about with such excitement at this meeting. So with that, do that, work, great. So who is Intuitive Machines? Who, who we are, who are we? You can pick. We were founded in 2013 by Steve Altimus, who had been a long time director of engineering at the Johnson Space Center, and uh, Dr. Cam Gaffarian, who some of you may know from the Goddard area as uh, the uh, founder of Stinger Gaffarian Technologies, which was a, um, uh, a NASA engineering services corporation that was at every NASA center. Um, and then myself that had to have an engineer in the founding team. So I was an active, active engineer at the time. Uh, we have over 100 employees. We operate in space, aviation, and the energy sectors. Those are all um, growing uh, sectors to apply engineering into. We thought that we could bring systems engineering and engineering techniques from NASA and, and be productive outside of just purely the aerospace domain. Um, but our key programs include our lunar payload and data services. So we have a lunar, lunar payload and data services program at Intuitive Machines. One of our first customers in that program is Clips, and then we'll talk about some of our other customers as well. Uh, and then also we have a, a line of fixed wing drones that we're in the process of, of deploying, and making operational. Uh, we have a bunch of smart folks. Um, and out of that hundred, we're mostly advanced degree seekers. We're still hiring as well, so there are a few positions left, so get the word out uh, on that. We're based in Houston. We're in the first floor of the Boeing building, if you've been in that area, which is just across the street from the Lunar Planetary Institute. And uh, we've grown out of that space, so we're moving to the sixth floor of the Boeing building, which will be our corporate engineering office and our mission control center. We also have a facility in what used to be the Houston Product Support Center at Ellington. We're actually the um, anchor tenant for the Houston spaceport. And that's where we actually do our spacecraft manufacturing, have our clean room, uh, additive manufacturing, and then our propulsion and avionics assembly all occurs there. So the space systems line, the aviation line, the energy sector line. In our space systems, we have vehicles that we, we produce and design. Uh, we have a very strong background in simulations and trainers that we've developed and deployed. And then a number of service lines, which were really the technology elements that go into making uh, the Nova Sea Lander I'll talk about. We also uh, sell those as services and technologies and license those themselves. Ah. Went too far? Maybe I didn't. So what is the Lunar Payload and Data Services Program? It's a cislunar transportation and infrastructure service that is bigger than landers. We had a discussion last night at, uh, at the CAB meeting about, you know, CLIPS is focused on landers. CLIPS is focused on landers for task order two, but the Intuitive Machines LPDS program can provide um, 100 kilograms landed anywhere on the lunar surface or 300 kilograms delivered to lunar orbit or payloads dropped off in transit or in a higher lunar orbit. So we have a lot of flexibility in uh, providing those needs. So uh, just a little bit of a background. Most of our team uh, that's working the lander 
has heritage from the Morpheus project. So this ran from 2010 to about 2014. Um, we continued to support this. Many of us did after we left NASA and went to Intuitive Machines. This is Free Flight 14, which was a night flight. I was the GNC lead for the Morpheus project. Um, the LOX methane propulsion lead that designed that engine was Rob Moorhead. He's now our propulsion lead. So uh, many people have jumped. Uh, we we kind of blew a hole in the gate at JSC and there was a jailbreak. Uh, a lot of people came with us. Um, and so this just gives you a feel. This, this lander, just to give you a, a feeling of what it is, it's uh, about the size of an ascent stage. And so that's a uh, lander probably three times the size of, of the Nova C that we're talking about right now. But um, in terms of familiarity with these systems and, and understanding how to put a lunar lander together and, and make the dynamics and the propulsion work properly, we're, we're very deep in that. There were a series of 15 free flights and over 32 tethered flights in this program. And, and that's what we stand upon. Uh, an interesting note about the LOX methane engine, it's a throttleable engine. So we throttle down all the way down to a five to one ratio, which means it's a very smooth ride for our payloads. Uh, we're not off, off pulsing the system and hammering the payloads. We just gradually throttle down, throttle down, throttle down all the way to land. Now the, uh, the end shot, this was the inspiration. I know Honeybee has a uh, camera we'll talk about later. I'm very interested to see that. But uh, as we came in for this night landing, this was a test at KSC at this shuttle landing facility uh, back in 2014. Seeing that lander come in at night and watching the plume illuminate the, uh, the synthetic lunar landing site that we'd set up, it was the closest that I had ever seen a non-CGI, non-science fiction actual landing on a planet. It was this planet. But the idea of cameras ejecting off of the, of the vehicle to capture that when we go to the moon is something we're also pursuing so that we can capture the descent and share that back because I think it'll be just as inspiring uh, when we go to the moon. And, oh wow, has, has YouTube moved on? Okay, <laughs> just to show it's not all glory days, uh, but we've actually uh, begun testing our uh, fourth generation LOX methane engines. So we need a smaller engine for this class of lander and uh, we're well through testing that. Actually, there's a number of test videos. We've got a, a very dynamic uh, um, a multimedia uh, communications director now who does a great job putting these things together. Otherwise, the engineers just pour over the data uh, clip after clip. So uh, moon landers, Nova C, I'll talk about it today. today. The C is for 100 kilograms landed. That's the capacity for that lander. Nova D is a design we have in the works to do anywhere from 500 to 800 kilograms. So that's getting up into the mid-class. Uh, that may be a central engine or a multi-engine design uh, that's still on our trade space. Um, additional services beyond that in the lander region. Communication services, I know a lot of folks here are talking about doing that. That's, that's something we provide once we're landed. And we're also evaluating the market for what we might uh, offer in that area. And then sample return capability is something that, that we have our eyes on as well. So uh, my question to Clive earlier about what the minimum quanta of sample return is, is not hypothetical. We've been trying to, to scale that for a while. Um, we have some great partners. Boeing is our partner on this and uh, provides us a deep bench when there are times where uh, a small company uh, has problems reaching in and, and, and finding a, an extra hand. Uh, of course, we're launching on a SpaceX Falcon 9 and we have a launch semester that runs July through October uh, of 2021. Nominal launch date in July. Uh, KSAT, KBR, Jacobs, and Southwest Research Institute are also partners with us. And looks like I'm just advancing through YouTube. Can you get me to the next slide? There you go. Okay, so our uh, IM-1, not to be confused with the astrobotic M-1, the I is very important, the IM-1 mission, um, very similar. <laughs> the, uh, the first principle is to minimize mission risk. So we have a rapid transit from LEO to low lunar orbit. We are configured to have enough Delta V to uh, perform a GTO TLI uh, if we need to. We could also perform um, a pure TLI uh, if we had to. So let me see, let me rerun that. We're configured for the GTO TLI. We can take advantage of a TLI to increase our mass uh, if the mission calls for it. We utilize a proven mission architecture derived from Apollo and NASA exploration studies, uh, gravity between the Earth and the moon from a vehicle level hasn't changed significantly, so the trajectories uh, should be fairly familiar. We have high TRL components in a Morpheus-derived design. 
it's not exactly the Morpheus design. This is not a four tank, uh, 5,000 kilogram lander. This is a two inline tank uh, robotic payload lander. Uh, mission control, maneuver planning, and navigation will all be done from the ground until power descent initiation. Once we're at power descent initiation, all the exciting stuff happens on the vehicle fully automated from that point on. For IM-1, we wanted to maximize mission value. So the way we approached it was two missions in one. We have a deorbit, descent, and landing um, suite, which is the NDL sensor and the scalp sensor that primarily operate from power descent operation to landing. And then after that, we have two science uh, experiments that'll run in a more pristine uh, radio environment. So we have Rolsys and LN1. I'll talk about those in a minute. That's important talking to the science community because the question is always, how do, you, how do you make everybody play nice with each other? And that's really one of the jobs that Mike Elke, who's our, our payload integration lead, um, that's his responsibility to make sure that as we bring the, the payloads in and we work that integration, that we're conscious of balancing out the requirements so that one payload doesn't interfere with the other. In this particular round of, of the CLIPS task order, uh, we proposed these instruments because we thought there was a clean separation uh, between them. We have two commercial payloads that also complement the NASA provided ones. And uh, a lot of the systems we're working also in parallel with Boeing uh, under a BAA to retire risk for cryogenic propulsion, precision landing hazard avoidance going forward for human systems. So a mission concept video, see if you can hit play on that one in the back. Uh, SpaceX upper stage. It's separated into a GTO. We are skipping past hours of commissioning and hand wringing and engine prep. Then we perform the TLI. Greatly abbreviated. <laughs> uh, we'll be on the moon within seven days of launch. I say within, and we advertise a five day transit. Uh, I'm talking to the right crowd. Uh, the minimum energy transit puts the moon at about the equatorial crossing. And uh, that's not always the lighting condition you want when you get there. And so we have loiter once we get there to make sure we land. Uh, in this iteration at this stage, we do not have nighttime survival. We're very interested in seeing that technology developed. Uh, it's a lot of work to go and land at the moon, right? And we'd like to see these things continue to operate. But uh, we do land at the 10 degree lighting angle to provide a full 13 and a half days of illumination. And our solar arrays are configured so that uh, the side panels capture um, the rising and the setting sun, and then the top deck is both for transit and for landing. This is a mid-latitude mission. All right, so go ahead and the next. Book. I guess I can go to the next chart. Oops, did I go one too many? Nope. There we go. Uh, the side solar arrays are configurable, of course, for latitude, and this is a mid-latitude region uh, landing. There was no requirement for a specific landing site uh, under the TO2 task order, so we have chosen also our landing site for maximum success. Power, we have the top deck solar array. Uh, we mentioned the two side ones. We have ample battery life size to make sure we can perform the complete EDL sequence, the DDL sequence, um, without being constrained for, for solar pointing. Our avionics are one fault tolerant. Nobody's taking it up on it, taking us up on it yet, but we do have um, high speed computers on board, which we are developing our flight software from the core flight software uh, paradigm. And that could lend itself for being a computing resource once we've landed as well. Um, common track, we have Omni and configurable high gain antenna. We're showing our patch antenna here. We also have a parabolic antenna uh, using tone ranging. What else is interesting here? I've mentioned LOX methane. Oh, uh, we have an all hat Morpheus derived uh, precision landing architecture, which we'll talk about in a minute. So how big is it? Uh, on the left, this was our, our uh, structural mock-up. And uh, we had, uh, we're not actually building it yet uh, to that level, but we were evaluating our clean room for assembly processes. And so had it in there. And then here's a, a representation of what it would look like on the moon. Payloads, uh, we have the navigation Doppler LiDAR for precise velocity and range sensing. That's uh, coming through JSC, but it's actually a Langley sensor. And uh, when we worked with the All Hat project, we had one of those on board it. Uh, we've also used that sensor with an Australian geophysical company for doing uh, gravity surveys. So we're very keen on this whole idea of prospecting and how we might use our landing sensors and, and vehicle capabilities to facilitate prospecting. 
Uh, we have scalps, which are stereo cameras for lunar plume surface studies, basically looking at what our main engine is going to do to the ejecta and how it's going to uh, blow the surface cover out as we come down. Uh, so those are our two DDL sensors. Like all the other NASA uh, CLIPS providers, we will provide the retroflector on the top deck. We have Rolls's, which is the low frequency radio uh, observer and Bob's here someplace with the uh, Rolls's team. Uh, lunar Node 1 is a lunar navigation demonstrator out of Marshall. We also have a precision landing hazard avoidance tech advancement uh, payload from Boeing. And we're flying the Eagle Cam from Embry-Riddle as a university payload. And that will be the camera that ejects from the lander as we come in for landing or capture the descent. And then we'll play that back later. Uh, as of this time, we have over 30 kilograms of unmanifested payload capacity. Uh, we are in negotiation with other customers, but uh, you know, the way the Tetris game of payloads fits, even then we may not fit all of that. So there's still opportunities to, to get on board. Our site location is 23.4 north, 8.9 east in longitude. That was purely chosen by orbital mechanics and launch opportunity. So uh, we have not yet begun approaching this from where does the science actually tell us to go, which is another reason that we're excited about uh, getting engaged with this community. It'll be on the western edge of the Sea of Serenity, uh, land within seven days of launch. We have opportunities all the way through the end of 2021. They actually get better as we go through the year, so the delta V requirements get less. It is a retrograde orbit. Uh, it turns out, uh, again, you guys know this, uh, positive grade versus retrograde at the moon is not nearly as big a deal as it is at Earth. It's only about a five meter per second difference because of the slow rotation rate. This allows us to come in on the day side uh, for our optical systems on the precision landing software. Oh, and thanks to the LROC team, uh, they, that resource is, is huge and uh, very excited to be able to take advantage of it for our flight. Uh, just a little bit of a ground track as we come in uh, that retrograde orbit, uh, 100 kilometers altitude. We're going for circular. Uh, there's no strict requirement that it be circular. That's just a, a, a convenient starting point, which we may refine once we get into the final trajectory plan. Uh, a, a kind of a, a busy chart, but it's a, a put together of how we're doing our precision landing and hazard avoidance. Essentially, we have a nav pod on the on the planetary face of the vehicle, which we'll use during the braking phase to do terrain relative navigation. And then when we pitch over, we have a nav pod on the forward facing, which will do our hazard field, hazard detection and avoidance. And um, all of this is informed by the all hat effort. And the, the, the trick here is, and what we're gonna work with the, the LROC team to determine, if we pitch over and image the hazard field before we run out of a priori LRO images to target with our camera system, then the precision really, really begins to shrink on this. And, and you're talking about meters of accuracy on the system. If that doesn't happen and we run out of uh, LRO images when we pitch over, then we begin to breadcrumb our way along with perceived motion on surface and it expands to the precision I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, those are our camera views as we come in on the final approach. So very excited about the high crater content uh, that we'll have early. Uh, very not excited about the empty spaces uh, towards the end of the trajectory. That's why we're going to engage the LRO team and, and get uh, a priori information views there. Just to give you a sense, this is uh, the landing site uh, at this moment at the 8.9 east, 23.4 north. And that's a 200 meter ellipse. So that is our navigation uncertainty that will be readily achievable from about six to 10 angles only measurements during the braking phase of the trajectory. If you stack on top of that a 100 meter divert, which uh, we derived also for some all hat studies, where in, in this case, I should show you a 90 by 90 field. You have the vehicle footprint dispersion ellipse, which is the size of your footprint plus your local landing accuracy altogether. And that's the size of a spot you want with the proper slope and no hazards, whether they're craters or, or boulders in that footprint. We definitely do not try to Tetris our landing gear around rocks. We're looking for a nice helipad type uh, landing site. So the larger ellipse gives you a, a feeling of if I were at the edge of my navigation ellipse and the safest spot was at the edge of that hazard map away from the center point, 
that puts us on something more like a 300 meter ellipse. So that's what we expect to be uh, the landing for the 2021 mission. Just for a reference, the yellow circle is the 10 meter vehicle footprint dispersion ellipse of our vehicle. And so we need to find a spot the size of that, um, that yellow circle somewhere inside the larger ellipse. That's our challenge. Um, the payloads uh, are, of course, the, the reason this service exists. And uh, we've been engaged with uh, the NASA payloads and then our, our non-NASA payloads have been developing the, uh, the PIPs, the payload integration plans for each of those. Mike oversees those, he's dedicated to doing that. And uh, as you can imagine, the, uh, the, the issues of, can you give me power? Can you give me communications? Uh, where, where will I be mounted? Those are all very important, but we're really uh, working the thermal, uh, thermal environment very, very closely. And, and that includes our, our, transit, um, uh, our transit conditions where we provide heater power because they'll be mostly in the shade. Unfortunately, there's no way to rotate the vehicle around once we land it. So everybody's gonna get some sunlight once we're on the surface and surface survival and, and how we can accommodate uh, the payloads throughout the, the lunar day. This is definitely the area where the deepest integration has to happen between the payloads and, and the vehicle. And I would offer to the community, keep that in mind uh, for these robotic missions because the available extra mass to uh, manage the thermal environment is, is gonna be a challenge. Power is easier, so keeping cold stuff warm, um, we'll, we'll be able to manage that a little bit easier. But uh, definitely, um, well, the moon's a, a tough place at the mid latitudes and the equatorial regions thermally, and that's something we have to work very closely with the payloads, and we're in the process of doing that. Okay, so uh, we're on schedule. We've ordered uh, our long lead parts. Um, we have a PDR in December, but it's really an integration PDR. Our main barrel structure and tanks uh, have already been uh, procured. The first barrel should be delivered next month. The first tank should be delivered a few weeks after that. Engine testing is proceeding. Uh, one of our philosophies is to get software and hardware together as soon as possible. So we have already integrated uh, our propulsion flight software with the test engine rig and worked through that in real time. So we're quite confident in, in all of our subsystems being on pace to integrate together. Um, CDR in May, and then uh, it'll be quite the interesting second half of 2020 and first half of 2021. Uh, getting everything integrated and tested and buttoned up and sent out to the Cape. But we're, we're excited to take the challenge and uh, we really, really want to be uh, a success story uh, along with Astrobotic. We wish them the best of luck so that the, the CLIPS program and this idea of uh, uh, shepherding in a commercial age for lunar transportation gets traction uh, now. So thank you. Yeah. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Many of you have wanted to propose instruments to click, so this is your chance to ask questions to get some real world experience of how that has gone. Hi, uh, Dave Draper, NASA headquarters. This is not about instruments, but uh, uh, I want to commend both you gents for these great uh, summaries of what you're doing. And you both mentioned hiring. And um, I know that in this stage of the game, I'm sure your, your workforce is dominated by engineering type people who can build a spacecraft and get them there. But at what stage do you think you're going to want to start bringing on some science folks? Because I'll bet you there are people in this room uh, in the early to early mid career stage who are really keen to help bring some science expertise to these uh, operations. And I hope that the uh, panel coming after this will also address this question. Thanks. Well, that's something that my eyes uh, were open to um, talking to Brett Denevi um, yesterday uh, during the poster session. So I, I was getting asked questions about, well, you have these sensors for your landing system. Are you doing science with them? And my response was, no, I'm landing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we don't know what we don't know. That's for sure. Uh, at least at intuitive machines. And so um, I think I can't answer when, but I feel the timeliness of beginning to engage, and not just for CLIPS, right? I mean, CLIPS is one avenue that, that a payload could get on. We sell a service. And so if you have a sensor that wants to come on a, on a different route, or if we could collaborate in a proposal to say, hey, uh, we would work together and we'd find a way to make this science happen, uh, we need an education on that. So we definitely need, um, I think, to bring some in-house expertise, but, but I think also 
uh, to stay involved with the league and, and to listen quite a bit. Yeah, I would echo those thoughts. Uh, we don't have, a, if you go on the website right now, we don't have an open position per se for uh, a science background because most of our, our hiring has been focused on actually making the, the first mission work. Um, I think it is incumbent upon us as companies to prove that this model works. Um, we're working really hard for success on mission one because ultimately that I think will allow us to continue to have uh, the runway as an industry to continue doing this model. Um, so really sticking the landing on the first one is, is top priority. Um, but I, I would echo the same thoughts that we wanna have a continued close dialogue. Um, part of the reason we have two full-time payload managers right now is to have that dialogue directly with the science community and the user community um, and have that on a regular basis. Um, so I'd say that, that sort of hiring is definitely coming, um, but first let's just get that lander actually safely on the surface. Parvati Prem, APL. Um, so Dan and Tim, you all are doing great work. Uh, your enthusiasm for this is, is infectious. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that because this, I, I want to preface, preface my remarks by saying that because you know, I, I in no way mean to diminish what you guys and your team are doing. But that said, I did want to say a couple of things. Um, so one is, I know that on at least one of your missions, you will be carrying human remains, ashes, uh, to the moon. And something that I found out very recently was that the last time NASA did this in 1998, it was a very fraught situation. So in 1998, when Luna Prospector impacted, it carried Gene Shoemaker's um, ashes to the moon. And so without diminishing Gene Shoemaker's standing in this community, um, that th the whole concept of sending ashes to the moon was something that was extremely offensive to the beliefs of the Navajo and a lot of other indigenous communities in this country. Uh, in 1998, NASA apologized for that publicly and said that it wouldn't undertake anything similar without getting the community's consent. And I know a lot, a, a fair number of us in, the, in this room are probably thinking, you know, who cares what the Navajo thinks? It, it's sentimental, it's, it's airy-fairy, but but sentiment does matter. We preserve and protect the Apollo sites, and that's not purely practical. There's sentiment in there. The reason we don't have these discussions about these sort of things is because there are no indigenous lunar scientists in this room. Um, and, and you know, I'm guessing not in your companies either. And so, so you know, so, so obviously I'm not ex expecting you to say, okay, we're gonna kick that payload off. I, I know that's not within your business model, that's not your decision. But it's something that I did want to bring up also in the context of Dave's question about hiring. Um, when uh, all of my degrees are in aerospace engineering, um, the reason I'm a lunar scientist and not um, an aerospace engineer is because it was intensely isolating being a woman of color in aerospace engineering. Um, neither aerospace nor the startup community are renowned for their diversity. And so since you're hiring, I think that's a great opportunity to make sure you keep that in mind because we keep saying we're going to the moon. The last time we did that, we meant a certain kind of American person. Not everyone shared in that. This is a chance to really do it different. And all of us, the scientists, all of our commercial partners, we all have that responsibility. Let's do it different this time. Um, without diversity, you know, you, you lose out on talent, if I say so myself. Um, but, you know, it, it also matters because going to the moon, it's, there's this we in it and who that we is, who the public sees represented, is really important. Um, but you're only doing great work. I don't mean to pick on you, but I do think these are important things to keep in mind. Hi, Elizabeth Frank with First Mode. Uh, so before I worked at First Mode, I was a planetary scientist at Planetary Resources. Dan, we've talked about this topic. So continuing along the thread of careers, uh, I joined Planetary Resources in 2016. Um, the company was founded originally in 2009, became public in 2012, and uh, I joined, and there were technical decisions that were made that would have gone differently if I had been in the room as a planetary scientist, because everyone there were engineers. So I don't want to undersell um, the ability of the planetary science community to inform technical decision making and business decision making um, in, your, in your endeavors. And, uh, so I'm super excited to see what you guys are going to do, um, but as someone who has been through uh, the failure of a startup company that could have used a planetary scientist earlier on um, and is one who's continuing in a, as a 
applied planetary scientist in a company today. Uh, yeah, I, I can provide some insight and perspective into the, the topics that uh, related to the intersection of science and engineering and academia and industry, because I think this is an exciting time for this field. Um, but there's certainly communication challenges that we have to overcome to kind of see the success of these endeavors. Thanks. So I, I, I'd like to comment. I, don't, I didn't think there was a question, but I'd, I'd like to comment. <laughs> um, yeah. The, uh, you raise a very good point. And this is one of the things we're going to have to try to feel out as a community um, as we move forward into, into commercialization. Because if this was a PI driven mission, right, we'd have a waterfall top down requirements tree and we would exactly meet the science need to that, that PI as a service. Um, it's not possible to do that in a generic sense. And so I think we all have the challenge of can we design a modular enough system that we can keep our costs down, but have enough flexibility within the system so that we do have time and we do engage the scientific community and go, well, what else could we add? Or in this mission, uh, the NRE to make an adjustment is not insurmountable. And that's, that's what we have to try to do to maintain a commercial viability. I don't know if you. I, I would share those thoughts and I think, um, um, and your point is well taken. I mean, it's not to diminish that at all. Um, I think you're, you're absolutely spot on. I think as we developed our design documents, um, a lot of that was formulated over the years of engaging here at League. I think this is probably my sixth League, maybe, uh, at this point. Um, so a lot of the documentation that I was highlighting in that list to help payload teams succeed was directly informed from that dialogue. But you're right, having it in-house is different. Um, so your point is well taken. Yeah, just as a quick example of the kinds of things I did at Planetary Resources, mechanical engineers would walk over to my desk and say, hey, what mechanical strength of the asteroid should I assume? And so I'd have to do a literature dive and get back to them with some realistic numbers. So there's like very much boots on the ground, shoulder to shoulder working together as a team that you know, I think you really need that perspective. Um, but I wish you the best of success. Great, thank you. Great. Time for one more. That's me. Uh, been through with Off Planet Research, and you guys are awesome, and NASA's awesome, and this is. Been through Off Planet Research, and you guys are awesome, I just want to say that, and the fact that we're sitting here talking about going back to the moon with launch dates is, is amazing. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, you're, I appreciate what you said, poverty. Um, I, I don't say it a lot, but I'm AT, which means I'm part Iroquois. Uh, and one thing I appreciate about NASA and about the community is the involvement and the fact that that is changing. And I'm proof of it, and a lot of people in this room, including you, are, are proof of that. It means a lot to a lot of people. And, and I appreciate what you said today. Okay, well, um, like if we um, end this discussion, we have another panel following. I'd like to thank our speakers one more time. Yeah.